It's great to worship with you this morning and uh, just praise our God together. That's always such an uplifting experience. And, and to know He's here, He's listening to us, and um, angels are worshiping with us. And it's just a great, great reality uh, that we uh, get to experience together. This morning, if you did bring a Bible, uh, whatever form that is, uh, we'll be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and be uh, working that direction, if you haven't already, that would be fantastic. Two committed Christians died on the same day, February the 12th, 2000. Um, those two individuals were legendary uh, National Football League coach Tom Landry and uh, also cartoonist Charles Schultz who uh, created and for so many years put together those Peanuts cartoons uh, that so many of us have loved uh, along the way. And both of these men were very well known for using their, um, their gifts to improve our world, uh, to convey Christian values. And a lot of people were very blessed uh, by the, uh, the ministry of Tom Landry and uh, the story of his life and how he encouraged his team and helped men to, to grow up and many of them to become followers of Jesus. And Charles Schultz, who uh, did such a great job and still does through uh, those same Peanuts cartoons that continue to show up in our comic strip uh, pages in our papers. Um, but several days after their death, a cartoon appeared uh, in several newspapers and it had a picture of Tom Landry walking with his arm around Charlie Brown. And Tom Landry was saying to Charlie Brown, now let's go work on that kicking game. Many of you that have followed that cartoon strip through the years know exactly what that is uh, referring to. Uh, Charlie Brown could never get that football kick. Lucy always moved it for him. Um, but anyway, what a great little story of some encouragement that was so fitting for uh, Tom Landry's life. I think all of us know the lift when someone encourages us. Uh, it, it lifts your spirit. Um, there's a warming sensation, kind of like somebody hands you a warm blanket when you're shivering, uh, kind of feeling. It's just, a, some people say warm fuzzies, I don't know. But it, it's just, a, it's a boost, it's a lift. It's, an, it's, a, it's great to receive some type of encouragement, especially when you know it's genuine. And many of us are not naturally gifted to be encouragers um, or find ourselves prone to encourage those who need it the most from us. Uh, family members, uh, people we work with, um, people we may be mentoring or teaching uh, that can really benefit a great deal from us trying to encourage. And so the call for us who aren't naturally gifted and are not prone to do that on a regular basis is to get better at that. Uh, and that's something certainly God knows to be very important. God knows how, in, in, uh, how important encouragement is to us. And that's why His love is affirmed to us over and over in the Scriptures. Um, it's there to encourage us, to continue to remember that we were created by the, the loving hands of God and we have been placed into this world with His image within us and every one of us are unique creations of His that He loves dearly. And no more clearly is that love for us seen than what we remember in our special time each week of the death of Jesus on the cross for our sin. And, and during this time, I hope that you take some time to not only talk to God about your sin and, 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 and seeking forgiveness and all those things, if you've not done that already, uh, is to be reminded of how loved we are. That Jesus went to the cross for, for your sin and my sin. And, and our sin is covered by His blood. And, and God is wanting to encourage us through that very aspect. He loves to lift us up and not beat us down. That's not his role. His role is to lift you up and to encourage you uh, in this very difficult world that we live in. You know, Paul, who called himself the chief of sinners, needed God's encouragement to represent him faithfully in a discouraging world. You know, Paul was one who was always very aware of his background. That 
you know, he had grown up faithful to God in his life, and for years he had persecuted and put to death many of God's people, Christians. And when Paul, when the light came on for Paul, he always regretted that. He knew it was covered by the blood of Jesus, but he still remembered his past. And it could have been used by Satan very much to discourage Paul, but God continued to encourage him. And Paul's theme of encouragement runs throughout the Testament, but certainly very powerfully in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And that's why we have selected this book, because we feel like that this is a time in our society when we need to be picked up. That we need to see some things from God that encourage us. It's a difficult time to live. We live in a difficult world. Our country's changing. Our world is changing. It's getting more and more difficult in more and more places to be a faithful Christian. And it's a time when we need encouragement. Some of you have been through some horrible difficulties. You've been through some very discouraging times. You've struggled with your life and you, you wonder what the future holds for you and you wonder how you're going to get through maybe some present things that you're dealing with. And it's so easy. We've talked about one of Satan's greatest tools is to discourage us, to get us so down and caught up in our troubles and our difficulties. And we have trouble being faithful to God and being those people that he's called us to be. And so we have chosen this theme for this period and we're going to be looking at this book very carefully to, to harvest from this book every, every bit of encouragement that we can as we live for God today. So that's why I want to encourage you to have your Bibles open as we work through this book together. We know that the Thessalonian Christians, when Paul wrote this letter to them, were facing intense opposition. And they were a minority and they needed encouragement. They were trying to live a faithful Christian life in a culture that did not encourage that at all and pushed back very hard against them and they needed encouragement. But they also needed to understand that they needed to encourage one another. It wasn't just something that they needed to receive from outside. They needed that, yes, but that wasn't the only part of encouragement in the Bible. The other part is realizing that they needed to encourage each other in the body of Christ that they were a part of. And that's what Paul was talking about. And I alluded to this verse last week in 1 Thessalonians 5.11 where he said, So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. You see, don't stop this. No matter how troubled you get, don't stop encouraging and building up each other. And today I want to look with you at five things that, that Paul modeled that made him an effective encourager. And these same things will help us lift up one another. They're listed on the back of your bulletin this morning. For those of you not aware of that, I just want to encourage you to go there. There's blanks you can fill in. Um, the first point as we think of Paul's uh, example was that encouragers feel genuine compassion for one another. Genuine compassion for one another. Paul genuinely cared about the people in Thessalonica. And I just want you to listen to some of the tender ways that he describes his ministry among them. Beginning in verse 6, he says, As apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you, like a mother caring for her little children. We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Because you had become so dear to us. Paul is speaking, you can tell as you listen to these words, as you read these words, Paul is speaking from his heart. He is talking about that he, as he ministered among them during his time there, that he had done so just as a mother would care for her little children. 
And those of you who are moms in this audience today that have, that have raised young children or you're doing that now or you're looking forward to that particular day, you understand how, how much that a mother will provide and cherish and protect her kids with her very life. It will be so sacrificial because you put their needs often above your own. And Paul said, I was gentle among you like a mom taking care of her little children. You know, gentleness is not a sign of weakness. Our culture tends to make us want to believe that. But real strength is not seen in violence, but in what one can endure with a gentle spirit. That's what I admire when I see people. How can they maintain that gentle spirit amongst their difficulties? Paul's deep concern for the people so moved him that he continually shared his whole being with the Thessalonians. You see, he and his companions who were there ministering and getting that church started in that, that city didn't just deliver words. He says, they gave their very soul to these people. And this was not some heartfelt performance, you know, get up on the stage and look so caring and ooze with concern and compassion for people. Paul said, I meant every word with passion. Can't you just hear it in his words? We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Because you had become so dear to us. You know, these are not words that you're going to say to a casual friend or a co-worker that you don't know that well. These are things that you will say to people that you've got a very close, authentic relationship with. That your hearts are bonded together. You feel the link and it's so easy to do things for each other. You know, one of the reasons God allows us to go through suffering is that it makes us more compassionate and more understanding so that we can encourage other people. You know, when you've had kidney stones and knee replacements and open heart surgery and prostate and, and breast cancer and the list could go on and on. When you've been through that experience and you hear about somebody that's been diagnosed with what you've had, what do you do? You go seek out that person. You offer to share with them some of the things that maybe you went through. Probably you're not going to share your worst case scenarios if that was your experience. But you want to encourage them. You want to say, yeah, there's going to be some tough times, but if you do this and this and this, it really helped me. And you find just, you have a deep well of experience that you can share and help somebody else. Paul could encourage these Thessalonian Christians who were going through such a touch, tough time of intense persecution because he himself has been through so much persecution. You know, from the time he converted to Christ and on that road to Damascus and, and became a follower of Jesus and then began wanting to preach and teach Christ. I mean, his life from that point on, as many of you know, was just one day of persecution after another. There were beatings, there was stonings, there was shipwrecks, there was opposition everywhere he turned. And he could not usually spend a long time in one particular place because the, the opposition was so intense. And so when Paul began talking to these Thessalonians as one who had experienced so much persecution, I think it helped those people. And no better could the person could they hear from. So instead of resenting a difficult experience, I think it's important for us to allow it to soften our hearts and open us up to greater compassion to people who are going through similar situations. And reach out to people when you can help them. We all have heard the, the quote from Cabot Robert that's been around for so long, it's so appropriate. And 
It says people don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. There's just something to be said about a relationship and a heartfelt one that can be such an encouragement to somebody else. But secondly about Paul, as we look at our outline, is that encouragers are alert to people's needs. They are alert to people's needs. Paul knew what was going on among the Thessalonians. In verse 9 he wrote, Don't you remember, dear brothers and sisters, how hard we worked among you? Day and night we toiled to earn a living so that we would not be a burden to any of you as we preached God's good news to you. Paul was well aware as he was ministering among the Thessalonian people that they, they were struggling financially and he knew as they formed the church and began meeting together and he was teaching them that they were not really able to pay him a salary that that would have been a tremendous burden for them and so he moonlighted as a, as a tent maker to provide for himself so that he could preach to them free of charge and support himself. He was aware of their needs. And an encourager is perceptive about the needs and the problems of others. You know, some people just seem to have this gift. The Bible calls it the mercy gift. They have this wonderful ability through the Spirit to feel what somebody else is feeling. They sense things about people that other people don't sense. And they reach out and they link and you know it's heart to heart. And it's a precious gift to have. We don't all have it. But some of you do. And some of us in, have similar experiences to what other people have. And it's, it's because of this similar experience that we, that we reach out to them and say, Hey, you know, I've been through that too. You know, I, I've helped so many people through death. But when my dad died a year ago in March... A whole other part of understanding grief became a part of my life. And I hope that's helped me become a better minister to people who are grieving. And so similar experiences sometimes help us to, to relate better to others and encourage them. But for some, it's just a trained discipline. You know, that you become aware through your life that you're kind of very self-centered. and You know, that's not really what God wants you to be. And... You know, every conversation, it's all about you. You know, you, find, you realize that, that God wants more from you than that. That you're, you're there for other people. And so you intentionally begin to discipline yourself to focus on the needs of others. And when you begin talking about them, you, you make sure that the, the focus stays on them and not so much on yourself. Maybe you, you still say, say things about yourself to, to bridge and relate. But you let this conversation be about them. You meet their needs. You talk to them about what concerns them. And this becomes a trained discipline for you that, that is needful because you want to grow to be the, the Christian, the Christ follower. You want to become like Jesus. But a good deal of perception, as I've learned, as you've learned, is being sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. You know, I don't interpret every impulse I get as being something from God speaking to me. But I, I know there are times when the Holy Spirit prompts me about the needs of other people. And I need to listen to that and I need to respond. And haven't you at times had moments when you found yourself thinking about someone? And it seemed like their name and their face just kept popping up in your head and you get curious about it and you decide not to just ignore it and go on and you you maybe call that person and ask hey hey what's going on just had you on my mind and my heart today and they and they say back to you sometimes how did you know that I really needed to talk to somebody today you know, it's kind of a moment when the hair stands up on the back of your neck and you, you realize that God's Spirit was speaking to you. And you responded as He would want you to. There are certainly times when the Holy Spirit prompts us from within. Thirdly, the best encouragers in our outline live wholeheartedly for God. They live wholeheartedly for God. 
Paul encouraged them to live lives worthy of God, and he gave them a lift by modeling that kind of life before them. Verse 10, he wrote, You are witnesses, and so is God, of how holy, righteous, and blameless we were among you who believed. You are a witness, as Paul said, but so is God of the kind of people that we lived, the kind of people we were as we ministered among you. Paul's saying this is, this is common knowledge. And we're not pumping our own, you know, pumping ourselves up or, or, or trying to put ourselves out there as, hey, we're so good. He's just simply saying that this is the kind of life we modeled before you. It's part of our teaching. And we do this for God and because of God. You know, it's discouraging to a Christian when another Christian gives in to the allure of sin or begins uh, living at a standard far below where they once were. You know, one of those people that you really respected and admired in the faith and all of a sudden they're not attending church or all of a sudden they've, they've accepted some substandard lifestyle and they know better and you know they know better and it's kind of discouraging when that happens. But you know when we see a Christian making consistent righteous choices, not just for a week or a month, but over time, it really encourages us because sometimes we feel weak. And maybe God is using those people to help encourage us to be more faithful, to be stronger, to be more disciplined, to be more available to God. You know, at times we're tempted to think that we live in such a, a corrupt, rotten world that it's impossible to live a holy, righteous, and blameless life like Paul. We kind of look at him as like some kind of a super person or something. And, you know, if you really dig into the Gospels, you know Paul was just a person. Yeah, he had God's help to the Spirit. And he was very devoted and passionate about God. But it's nothing you and I can't be. But you know, when we see others being faithful, it should lift us to be the very same way. Let that inspire you. And we have examples of that around us today. You know, maybe you notice someone that's, you know, doing something that you think might be difficult for them as a Christian and you're, in, you're inspired by that. You find yourself saying, you know, she can come to church services every Sunday without her husband. You know, I can be more faithful in church services. If he can overcome an addiction, you know, I can too. If they can come and worship the Sunday after losing a child, I can be more faithful. After everything they've been through and they've kept such a positive attitude, I can do better than I'm doing. You people can inspire us in the Lord. Years ago, I heard Mark Scott at uh, Ozark Christian College telling about a guy who was a believer and, and shortly after he was involved in an explosion in the workplace and, and he suffered greatly. Both of his arms were severed by the blast and he was blinded by this as well. But he did survive as difficult and, and awful as that was. And after many surgeries and many months of counseling, he was able to, to go home and begin living his life in a very, very different kind of way. But what disturbed him as a, as a young believer was the fact that he, he could no longer read the Bible. You know, he was upset that he, he didn't have arms to hold the Bible and, and you know... He couldn't read the page, even if he could. And this was, as you can tell, before there was audio recordings of the Bible, you know, that you and I have so readily available today. You know, first it was the cassettes with Alexander Scourby, and, you know, then it was the CDs, you know, that you could buy. And, and now today, all you got to do is flip open the app on your phone. You can let it, it'll read the Bible to you. Fortunately, this gentleman didn't live in that time frame. But he cried out to God that he wanted to read God's Word. And he knew he needed to grow as a Christian. And so along the way he heard about a lady in London, England who also had lost her arms and, and she was blind as well. And she had um, taught herself Braille by pressing her lips to the Braille print on the page. 
And she began reading the Bible that way. And so he thought, I can do that. And so he ordered a, a Braille Bible. And he set it down. And he began moving his lips over the Braille type. And you know what? He discovered that he didn't have enough sensation in his lips to even feel the bumps. And he was so discouraged and strawed again. And he's crying out to God. And he was so disappointed. He needed the Word of God. He needed to be able to, to read this and to grow from this. And he accidentally touched that as he's praying with his tongue. And he realized that he had enough sensation in his tongue to feel the Braille print. And so he learned to read Braille with his tongue. And at the, by the time this article was printed, he had read through the, Bra the Braille Bible four times with his tongue. And I don't know about you, but when I hear a story like that, I'm encouraged and I'm inspired, but I'm also a little ashamed. Because I can hear it and I can read it just fine. But am I that hungry for the Word? Do I feel like I need it so bad? I've got to be in it every day. I think people like this, to you and I, let them be encouraging. Let them inspire you. Let them create with you for God. God and be with His people, people in worship. worship. You know, you know, Paul, Paul loved, loved the Thessalonians, Thessalonians as a mother, mother but, but he also loved, loved them in a, in a paternal, paternal way. way. He, he says, says in verse, verse 11, 11 and 12, for, for you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Be during Paul's time with the Thessalonians, he urged them to live lives worthy of God. But he also comforted them. He pushed them. But he also comforted them as they needed. And you know, when you grow up in a home with two parents, you realize that mom has a role and dad has a role. And I realize everyone doesn't get to grow up in a, a home with two parents. But dads often are the ones that push you to be a little bit more, to reach a little higher. Not that moms don't do that, because moms do too. They're often in a home like that. The, the, the urging and the encouraging and the comforting comes in a little different ways. And Paul was saying he had a maternal concern for them, but he also had a paternal concern for them. He was their spiritual father in every sense of the word. He encouraged them. He comforted. He prodded the, his children in the faith. But I think it's important to point out here that Paul also urged them to live lives worthy of God. You'll find him saying this phrase several times in several of his epistles. To live lives worthy of God. And I was looking at that this week and worthy means equal weight. And so if you're imagining a, a set of balances here, that God is on one side and we're on the other, and Paul is saying there should be equal weight. And you know, when you think about that, it seems kind of impossible. You know, if I've got God on one side of the scales and me on the other, boy, it's going to be really out of balance. But Paul is calling us to a higher standard. He said, this is what you're striving for. You're striving to be like God. You're striving to be like Jesus. And I understand as I read this that we settle for far less than we should. We're contented with so much less than what God desires for us. Let the scriptures call you to a higher standard of living for Christ. Fourthly, encouragers understand the importance of expression. The importance of expression. Paul took the time to write and express how he felt. So many times we respect and admire someone or we really appreciate something that they, they do and we just don't mention it to them. 
you know, maybe we think about it for a moment. We think, you know, I'm going to say something to them later. And then we get busy in our other things and the moment's gone and we forget about it. I'm guilty of that, I'm sure. You are too at times. But good encouragers take the time to seek the person out and verbalize what they're thinking. I want to give you just some quick guidelines for expressing encouragement. And the first thing is to be specific instead of general when you encourage somebody. Instead of saying something like, you know, I really like the lesson. You may say something like, you know, I really like the lesson, especially when you talked about controlling the tongue. Boy, I really needed to hear that today. Or instead of saying, I hear good things about you at work. Instead of saying, I hear good things about you at work, you're always on time. You never complain. And you always have such a good spirit about you that lifts up other people. Be specific when you can instead of general. It'll mean so much more. Another guideline is to be genuine. I mean, I don't think anybody's encouraged by somebody that exaggerates and gushes over you. Because it just doesn't feel sincere. And you might appreciate hearing those things, but just don't think it's really, really encouraging in its own way. I think it's important to be balanced. You know, being an encourager doesn't mean you're always saying lovingly flowery things about what other people do. Sometimes, because we love and care about people and want to encourage them, there needs to be a rebuke sometimes, but with a gentle spirit. Let it be balanced. Sometimes the most encouraging thing we can do is to help right or wrong, help re refocus somebody, point out some blind spot that they have with a gentle spirit so that they can respond to that in the best way. I think another good guideline is to be alert. That sometimes there's some people that do things that aren't up front and aren't out for everybody to see and we need to pay attention to some of those people behind the scenes that do a lot of very valuable work but aren't always singled out for appreciation. And a lot of you are behind the scenes people and I know behind the scenes people don't really seek attention but if you do it in the right way it can mean an awful lot. I think another good important guideline is to write, write it down. You know, it's nice to hear things from people when they verbalize and say things. But don't you love it when somebody writes down their encouragement and hands it to you? And sometimes you find yourself reading it again later in the day and maybe a couple days later you pick it up, you read it again. It's, it warms your heart every time you read it. I was encouraged very early in ministry <clears throat> uh, by a professor I had to, to keep a hang in their folder. You know, when people give you a note of encouragement or a, a card or something expressing some thanks or just a little note, and it really boosts your spirit to tuck it away in that envelope, you know, in that folder. And when you get kind of discouraged and feel down and feel like you're not really worth much, uh, you just really screwed up something. And, you know, it's just so good to be able to open up that folder and to be encouraged again. Maybe some of you need to hang in their folder yourself for those tough times in your life. And the last encouragement here is to do it now. You know, good, good intentions aren't really ever enough. And what we need to do is make sure we say what needs to be said now while we have the chance. The last point in your outline this morning is that encouragement comes from receiving well. Not only did Paul encourage the Thessalonians well, but they received it well. Verse 13, he wrote, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. You know, two people can sit in the same worship service and one of those people lead the service feeling flat and like there was really nothing inspiring in that service at all. But another person leaves and they're, they're all very inspired, encouraged. feel like the Lord spoke to them. They enjoyed worship and have a very, very different take on the same service that they both sat in. So what makes the difference? 
Well, sometimes it depends on how well they receive. If you place an empty bowl under a water faucet and you turn on the water, a lot of that water is just going to shoot out probably all over your, the front of your shirt or dress or top. There's nothing in that. It's empty. It can't hold what has been placed there. But if you have something of substance in the bottom of that bowl before you put it under that faucet, maybe a, a good porous sponge or a thick cloth, when you turn on that water, a lot of it's absorbed because there's something of substance there to soak it up. And people who have something of substance in their life, a living relationship with God, a hunger, an interest in God, and they hear the Word, they soak it up because they hear it knowing it's God's Word. It's living. It's holy. It's there to speak to your heart. And it, it brings a very, very different reception to what is being shared. I like the Hebrews chapter 4 verse 2 passage that says, For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. Their receiving encouraged Paul. And receiving is boosting to the giver. It's so important that we encourage one another. Years and years ago, John Bell served as a president of Special Olympics, and he told of a 100-yard dash where eight handicapped youngsters started off with arms and legs flying everywhere. But 15 yards into the race, one of them fell down and injured himself on the cinders. The other seven stopped, turned around, came back, picked him up, brushed him off, and together they walked arm in arm to the finish line. You know, the Christian race is really tough. Tougher than any of us can really handle on our own. And some Christians along the way are falling down. And this is no time to leave them behind. It's time for us to reach down, pick them up, brush them off. And hopefully, they will walk to the finish line with us. I realize sometimes Christians that have fallen don't really want our help. But it shouldn't stop us from offering, reaching out to them, helping, encouraging, and hoping that they'll walk with us to the finish line. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the encouragement of this letter to the Thessalonians. I know Paul meant it so specifically to the people of that time and what they were going through, but it's a general message from you that also applies and fits into our situations as your people today. And Father, I know that's why you've had these words recorded and and pass down so that we would have them today because we too need encouragement. We certainly need your encouragement. But Father, we need the encouragement of others. But we also have the task as we've learned and will continue to learn to encourage one another. It's not just about us receiving encouragement, but are we working harder and getting better at encouraging each other? We need each other so much. We need a strong family. We need encouragement of the church family. We need to come in here together and be boosted by our worship together. And as we serve you within the, the walls of this place and as we venture out into our community and neighborhoods, as we seek to share Jesus intentionally, as we grow to become more like him, that there's people that we need to encourage and help and bring into the light so that they can see the truth as well. But may we always do so, Father, in your spirit, in the way you want your word proclaimed and lived and shared. May we be those kind of people. 
we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I like so much the words of Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. It says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do. But encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. May we don't stop and think enough of how encouraging it is when we gather together to worship. When we look around and see other people praising God with us. When their hearts are extended to the Heavenly Father. When we see heads bowed in prayer. And when we, we worship together around the Lord's table. And we place our gifts into the plate. And when we listen to the Word. And we got our Bibles open. You don't stop and think of how encouraging that is to people around you. And how important it is that you're faithful. That you come each week. And that you worship God. And you will be encouraged, but you will also be an encouragement to other people. Don't stop being faithful. Be an encouragement through this very, very great opportunity. This morning, if you would like to talk to someone about a relationship with Jesus, if you've never really personally accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, I'd love to talk to you about what the New Testament teaches about becoming a follower of Jesus happy to meet with you and speak to you about that and we can open the word of God together there'll be some at the back table wearing badges as well that are there uh, to do the very same thing to talk to you about becoming a part of this church family what that means and how you go about that or or maybe just today you just need somebody to pray with you maybe you're going through a particularly discouraging time right now and you just really need somebody just to, to open up and pray to God for you to help you you come to one of us today and allow us to share the Lord with you in those opportunities as we stand together and as we worship.